Hi, I'm Brandon Poe, founder of Poe Group Advisors and creator of the Accounting Practice Academy. You are listening to the Accountant's Flight Plan Podcast, where we talk about stuff in the accounting world. If you're looking to buy or sell a practice, we are the premier accounting practice intermediary firm in the industry. Check us out at pogroupadvisors.com. If you're a firm owner looking to build a more profitable practice while actually reducing owner hours, sign up for our practice management workshop, which only runs a few times per year. Learn more at accountingpracticeacademy.com. All right, I am really excited to have two guys from Gusto on the podcast today. And if you're not familiar with Gusto, um, you need to check it out. I've got Matt Woodson. He's a partner advisor at Gusto, and he helps firms, uh, guide firms to adapt, adopt the cloud accounting model through modern technology. Uh, Matt's able to provide his partners with a holistic approach to obtaining and onboarding new clients through Gusto's people platform. And then uh, Will Lopez, who's featured in Forbes, Business Insider, Accounting Today, and Fast Company, is the head of Gusto's accountant community and chief architect to People Advisory. Uh, Gusto is the people platform that enables 6,000 plus and counting accountants to advise more than 100,000 plus small businesses nationwide pay, insure, and offer modern wellness benefits to their hardworking teams. Um, and Will, before he founded Gusto, he founded AdvisorFi, which is a modern accounting firm that helped both entrepreneurs and accountants leverage digital transformation to benefit their businesses and clients. Welcome, Matt and Will. It's good to be here. Awesome. All right, so I always like to start with this, this question. How did you get into accounting? Tell us about your background. What led you here in this, on this path that you're on? Yeah, I'll, I'll dive in myself. I mean, so I was born into a family of entrepreneurs. So my, uh, my parents have always owned their own business for as long as I could remember prior to even me being born since I was, uh, I, my parents had me late in life. And so I grew up just hearing stories about business and just wheeling and dealing and things that they loved and, and how to put food on the table through a business and caring for your employees and everything that went around that. And uh, I knew one day I'd do something with business. I just had no idea it, it would actually be through accounting, <laughs> which is really interesting. And, and uh, just after graduating high school, um, I took, personally, I took a, a part-time job, um, or I'm sorry, a full-time position as a um, project manager, manager for a like parking company. And that's actually how I got introduced to accounting. So it wasn't even through my college courses was I introduced, but it was more of just day-to-day -day work. I was a non-conventional student, went to school on nights and weekends, and then kind of worked full-time and paid my way through college. But through that, I kind of learned a lot of the grassroots accounting and um, took a position as a controller for a large non-for-profit, which was really exciting. And through that, I actually learned how to write crystal reporting. I, I, I learned how to convert like QBD, QuickBooks Desktop to Sage 200, which was a, a platform that we were using at the time. And then actually building accounting bridges from different areas of this non-for-profit, like a retail store to, to the back house of General Ledger. So just kind of learned really early on how it all worked. And then I finished my accounting degree and took a job in public accounting as a financial statement auditor. So, um, you know, fast forward five years, which felt like 50 in public accounting, of course, um, started my own practice uh, about eight years ago and it was cloud-based and we had clients in over 40 states and three countries and just loved, 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 loved my profession and loved accounting and wanted to just personally do something a little bit more modern than what I was used to. Yeah, that's a cool story. I like how you, you kind of found your own way, probably mm -hmm. from that entrepreneurial background from your parents. Like you learn to kind of cut your own path to get where you are. And that's really cool. Nice. Uh, thanks for sharing that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, how about you? How did you uh, 
Yeah, so see where you are. That's funny. Accounting. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily choose accounting. I think the accounting industry uh, chose me a little bit. Uh, so I, I have a background in, in medical um, sales and medical uh, administration. So uh, I kind of got burned out of that after a little while, took a little break and uh, had a few uh, acquaintances in my network that worked at Gusto, invited me to come check it out. I ended up getting recruited uh, for Gusto into um, their advisor program. And, you know, didn't know a whole lot about uh, the accounting industry other than I do come from a family of small business owners. So I've seen the books. I went to business school, so I have a gist. Uh, but it was really when I joined Gusto and I learned about the accounting pr uh, partnership program, uh, which Will is our head of community in that, in that program, is when I started to kind of pique an interest there. And so I, I learned a little bit about it and uh, ended up applying for an open position in this program and, and got it. And then from there, I've now worked with uh, everyone across the board, accounting uh, professionals, you know, CPAs, bookkeepers, advisors, consultants, um, all 50 states. So it's it's been a fun, fun journey for me. I have learned a lot. And uh, I think the biggest thing for me, the eye-opening uh, draw was to see how successful small businesses can be when they have an accountant, uh, when they're linked to an accountant. Uh, it's really, really important. And it's also very eye opening to see that a small business that can make or break a small business, right? If they have a good accounting team at their back. Uh, so that's why I wanted to kind of dive in and help those small business owners through my accounting partners. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. I don't think, you know, I, I feel like most accountants realize they can really help their small business clients, but I don't think that they fully realize to what extent they're able to have an impact. Mm. Um, which I'm sure we'll get into that more momentarily, but um, I want to back up and just tell a little bit about my story with Gusto. So I recently, full disclosure here, I recently became a Gusto client and I had been happy with the payroll company that I had worked with for years, but I made a software switch. I switched from QuickBooks to Zero, and my Zero um, CPA advisor, I don't know what I would call him, but anyway, he um, said, let's switch it over to Gusto. And it's just a seamless integration. I have never been that excited about a software like in a long time. I couldn't <laughs> believe how, how easy it was to use, how easy the setup was, how easy the transition was and how um, well it worked. And I'm sure I've only scratched the surface of what Gusto offers, but just from a experience, you know, user point of view, I, it blew me away. And then I started um, learning about Gusto and I saw, you know, your growth trajectory has been quite steep. Like you've grown pretty rapidly and it's not surprising. Like it's a good product. And um, so there's my um, two cents on Gusto just from an experience. Um, so I want to get into kind of like um, more about um, sort of from your experience and Will, I'll ask you this question first, like, or, or to you and Matt, if you want to chip in, but what advice, uh, if, if you were going to talk to somebody who's planning to start a practice from scratch, uh, given what, you know, your experience, you started a cloud firm. Mm -hmm. What would you, uh, what would you tell them? Yeah. You know, I, there's, there's so much to say that I, when I was giving thought to just this, this particular question, I think if I were to go back to old will or, or young will <laughs> and say, Hey, you know, you could save yourself a lot of heartache, a lot of time and a lot of, uh, a lot of money. I'd say there's probably like two key themes that I have just come to learn and understand about our profession. Um, is it's it's it, so two things around one is just what you're selling, and I think there's 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 a lot of confusion for, uh, that clients receive when we sell the wrong thing or they place the wrong you know. Or, uh, a certain value on something that an accountant is selling or offering. 
And I, I think if we slowed down just a little bit, understood what we were selling, which is a service and not a good, and who we are in the midst of that sell, in the midst of that service, I think it would go a long way. Because I think this is where uh, what I would call like an identity crisis has occurred within the, the accounting profession. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of entering in the third decade of the 21st century, right? And um, there was a recent survey done by Sage uh, that surveyed like 3,000 accounting professionals globally. And it said that 90% of, of that 3,000 believed that there was a cultural shift in accounting. And as with any other vocation, you know, accounting, the accounting profession is responding to business and societal changes in the midst of a, a modern ecosystem, right? And so a lot of the data suggests that these cultural changes that are shifting are kind of driven because of clients and marketplace changes, um, heavy, heavy innovation around technology. And I think if I were to go back to myself 10 years ago and say, you need to really fundamentally understand who you are in the midst of all this as a professional, what you're selling in the midst of all of this as a professional, you'll, you'll be able to communicate the real value that you're really trying to communicate and not get caught up in, I think, a lot of the, the low margins, the fee pressures, the, the pushback that a lot of clients give accounting professionals because they seem to equate, let's say, the solution versus the specialist, right? Um, and, and, and clients seem to think that accountants are just kind of like a, a one rung up above the solutions that they use, and that's anything but, but the case. Um, but I think a lot of that requires some really kind of like finding yourself and who you are as a professional and, and how to properly position yourself in the midst of all of this. You need to know how you can add value and be able to articulate that. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, exactly. And you need to understand that your value is absolutely different than the solutions that you, that you use to deliver that value. Right? right. Those are two distinguishing value propositions that an accounting professional makes and, and where accountants really get caught up in is selling the solution more than themselves um, and so then the client is unable to differentiate, well, what makes you different than this thing that you're selling? Right. Um, and, and I think that's, that, that's still such a, a pain point for the profession is we've not figured out how, like, that we are indeed different than the solution. And I, maybe it's, it's, we're given the, um, you know, my observation is a lot of times accountants are, so keen on most of them really want to help their clients. Right. But they're letting the client control the conversation more so than the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, so if the clients focus on the solution, then you've got to, you've got to understand how to have that conversation beyond that solution. Right. Like there's a lot more nuance to, which is what you're getting at. But I want, I want to go back to what you're saying about cultural shift um, how would you describe that cultural shift? Like, cause I feel like it's multifaceted. Like it's, it's about, um, the workforce is changing. Yeah. So those expectations are changing. The technology is changing. Um, you know, what, how would you characterize the, the major, what do you think's driving most of the cultural change? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a generational collide that's happening. Um, you got workforces that are becoming ever more multi-generational, right? Um, you know, as, as, as baby boomers, let's say, meets m the millennials, you know, the profession is beginning to be infiltrated by new and different attitudes, um, expectations, and, and, and different kind of skill sets. Um, and then this that experience really just brings that organic change to the profession that is occurring. Uh, but it also means that practices need to offer the same benefits as let's say blue chip companies or, or in order to attract and retain this, this new generation of thought. Right. And, um, and, and just in the industry, the, the, the ongoing digital revolution is also contributing to that overall shift as well, right? So with technologies like, you know, cloud computing, cloud accounting becoming mainstream, 
and artificial and let's say AI, you know, easing the administrative burden, this really helps forward thinking practices to be more productive, but yeah. it also forces them to accept the challenges of augmenting, you know, the, the current practice life. Um, and, and so I, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's unfortunately a big pot of, of just generational change, digital change, business transformation change, and then paradigm, you know, just thought change. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think when you add that all together, you're, you're getting a, a pretty interesting experience of who am I in the midst of all of this and my firm needs to evolve in order to, to keep up. I, and I've, I've, I've said this for years. I think the entrepreneurial CPA, which you have an entrepreneurial background, um, is going to win big time in this environment. Oh, absolutely. Because there's so much change happening. If you can uh, learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable with the change, you're going to win through all this. Um, which, you know, I've been thinking recently, like this, this whole the changes we've gone in through in 2020 with COVID have forced change upon the entire industry. And I'm wondering if, if that's going to really spark, um, you know, um, this shift that has been building to, to expedite post COVID. Um, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure Matt can attest. I mean, it's what we've seen with our partner program and, and I'll just make this little call out, Matt. Um, but there was a there was a white paper rolled out by Smart Vault um, in the midst of COVID, and it was such a great uh, read. But it was called "The Impact of COVID nineteen on the State of Accountants." And in this report, which is encourage everyone to read this, but they surveyed over I think eleven hundred accounting professionals from eighteen different countries in order to generate what the impact of COVID was on the profession. And basically, the top takeaway was. Uh, they, they categorized firms into most successful and least successful uh, in the midst of all of this. And the most successful firms throughout the entire pandemic were the ones that were already cloud-based technology leaning firms that were also entrepreneurial as well. The ones that were least successful were the ones that were responding and putting more energy into incorporating new approaches, new technology to enable remote work and communication with teams and clients. So instead of being already in a position to respond, you know, at the drop of a hat, because they had the, 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 the firm mentality and the malleability within the practice life to, to respond that way, those firm, you know, the firms that didn't utilize that were the least successful throughout this whole pandemic. Yeah. And, and then the, and the report basically ultimately culminates saying that, uh, that the majority of respondents agreed that COVID-19 is acting as a forcing mechanism to get more firms to, and clients to really embrace two things. One, cloud-based technology, allowing them to do their job better, but then two, offer more strategic advisory services yeah. because that's what everyone was looking for during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, well, we could probably talk for hours on that topic though. So, um, well, let me, um, let me go to my next question. So what is one idea, observation or insight that you've had, or you've learned from your work that you consider to be the major contributor to the success of your clients? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Matt. Yeah. So within regards to, you know, within regards to that option, when, when we refer to clients for me, it's, I'm going to be talking about partners. So accounting partners, um, just to set the stage there, but honestly, one of the biggest major ideas or contrib contributions of that is going to be the adoption kind of segue right from where we were just talking about that cloud-based uh, technology solution. So we had, I, I was just pulling up uh, a couple of, different statistics I was looking at uh, as you all were talking about um, this white white paper and these pages that came out on the studies. But we had an infiltration of accounting firms calling us uh, probably three weeks post, you know, lockdown. Uh, 
looking to get set up with gusto. And the reason being is that they were simply were not ready for uh, that shift and that, that um, remote cloud-based uh, idea that was that they, I'm sure they've heard about for the past several years, but have kind of ignored a bit. Uh, so I, I was looking at, you know, things like uh, native solutions and native softwares that, you know, maybe they have to go to the client office uh, to chat with about, to review with um, native solutions like you know, QuickBooks desktop is probably the most popular like native software you can think of, right? They all had these and now they're all remote. So not only is their firm remote, but their clients are remote and they're remote to their clients. Uh, so you start looking at things like uh, DocuSign and secure document sending. I was just looking up the DocuSign stock from March to now went up like 140 something percent. Like it's just the things like this, you start thinking about, well, they weren't really set up for success. And now that idea, which uh, for us here at Gusto, the idea is not really all that new. That's what we've been kind of preaching for a while. Uh, for Will, it's not really all that new. It's what he's been doing for the last eight, nine years. Uh, but now this concept in the grand scheme of things is, is a new idea, a new contribution, a new player where people, uh, you know, accountants in the accounting industry is starting to take a look, a closer look at the cloud-based solution, uh, the cloud-based tech stack. And they're starting to say, okay, maybe this will contribute to the success of my firm, to the success of my growth, to the success of my client's growth. Uh, so that's kind of what my take on that would be. Uh, and I think that really kind of wraps it up. It's not just Gusto. There are so many other solutions out there uh, that we can talk about for days uh, that really kind of uh, encompass that idea. Yeah, I agree. Remote work has been, uh, yeah, it's, it's really sparked people to make some changes. So uh, that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. And, I, and I'd add to that, you know, I, I'm no longer in practice. So I, I left my practice 15 months ago, sold my practice, sold my home, moved from South Florida to Denver to, 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 to empower my profession through Gusto and support my peers. And, uh, and so while I don't have any small business clients anymore, or mid market clients anymore, um, I really do treat uh, my peers as my, my, my existing client tail. Right. And one thing that I would say, one observation that, would be most successful for my peers to understand is that when you combine modern technology with your, your financial acumen and, and expertise, where your expertise takes priority, which is primary, you need to understand that technology is secondary and it always has been and it always will be. And, uh, and that's what we believe at Gusto, right? So Gusto exists to make your job easier not to replace you. And, and, and automation and, and things like that has, has brought significant changes to the accounting profession over the last decade. All good things. No one's going to deny that. But while some tools have really made accountants' lives easier, others have kind of chipped away at the roles because they're trying to disrupt a, a, a legacy industry. Right. And so, um, you know, what I try to do, at least from, from the observation on my side is encourage my peers to understand that tech companies that develop these tools to their benefit have also created and sometimes have perpetuated this false debate where automation will overtake the industry. And it's just not true. And that's that's not that's something that I think the, that one needs to understand um, when partnering with a resource where a resource like Gusto um, is really here to not replace you or even, you know, circumvent your value, but to actually augment your value. Because the ultimate goal here is that a valued accountant is a holistic business advisor to clients, you know, solving human problems that technology simply can't, and we will never be able to, right, solve on its own. And, and technology has a role to play, but only, only to boost, you know, the, the advising, problem solving, and, and business strategy accounts already do on a daily basis. So, you know, I, I think that's a big observation we need to r rally around. Yeah. And I would say it really enables that to happen at all because what I run into with, especially, you know, we sell firms from, you know, on the small side, uh, a few hundred thousand dollars up to 
um, you know, three to 5 million. And the biggest complaint that I hear from owners is they don't have time and capacity to do what they need to do. Right. And so they barely have enough capacity just to get the compliance done in their practice, let alone get into advisory projections, forecasting, all of the things that the small business clients really want. Mm-hmm. They're not mm-hmm. even getting to tax planning, half of them. Well, I shouldn't say that. A lot of them are not even able to really be as proactive as they could be on the tax planning side. So the tools, you know, if if you can do the compliance work more efficiently, it frees you up to do the things yep. that you real that your clients really want. Right. And approaching those tools conventionally, like this tool is trying to replace my position of forecasting or so on and so forth, really uh, doesn't enable you to actually achieve the goals that you're trying to achieve, right? Like, you know, fulfilling those needs that small business clients have, right? And I, and I think it's, it, it's, it's interesting to me where, you know, we want to get to a place as a profession, but we're scared to adopt some, some, you know, certain sorts, some kinds of technology because we think it's going to replace us. If, but to your point, it's actually not here to replace us. It's supposed to free us up. So that way we can actually get to the things that we're trying to get to. Yeah. Um, yeah. It reminds me, I wrote a column with a, a, a guy, a CPA who grew from zero to a hundred million in his firm. And uh, his name's Rob Siegfried and, um, one of the things that he says about CPA firms in particular is there, there's usually somebody on, if you have multiple partners, there's somebody that's change resistant. And so, um, I feel like now with COVID that change resistance has been, um, yeah, that's one barrier that's coming down. So it'll be interesting to see how things develop. Yeah. Change, change was pretty crazy before COVID, but now that everything's crazy, it's not so crazy anymore. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, well, so how did you, you know, did you mostly discover sort of this through your own development of your own cloud firm? Like how did you, um, when did you, when did this hit you that, um, the tools really enable, they're not going to replace. When did that dawn on you? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, for me in particular, and I'd love to hear Matt's take on what he's hearing out, you know, in the field, um, on my side, mainly trial and error, <laughs> you know, combined with, uh, some heavy risk taking and, and, and certain kinds of behaviors of, of just not using, the professions conventional, the profession, my profession's conventional approach towards engaging clients a certain way. Um, you know, I, as head of Gusto's accountant community, I also advocate very heavily of our profession, where it's going, uh, what's really resonating, what's working, what's not working internally to Gusto's leadership. I, I own all our in, internal research around the accounting profession. I read a lot of white papers. I serve up a lot of data. Um, and that's even what has brought People Advisory Powered by Gusto, which is a new revenue stream, advisory revenue stream for the profession, just actually happened through Gusto. So, you know, for me, what I discovered was um, that, you know, when I first started my practice, I realized that there were a lot of countries that were much more modern uh, as a profession than we were here in the States. And, and thanks to a lot of friends to, in Canada and, and UK and Australia and New Zealand, um, who I became friends with early in my practice life, really encouraged me to really think differently about my practice because it was being thought differently in other parts of the country or other parts of the world. And, um, that just proved to me that there is viability behind this. This is a real thing. It's not a trend. It's not a fad. And then just as time passed by, we saw more and more and more data behind it showing that, yeah, a firm could be, you know, two to three times more successful if it, if it rethinks its digital transformation and its own business transformation and it engages into that. Um, so yeah, for me, trial and error, 
you know, observation. Um, also just kind of reading the tea leaves. <laughs> you can kind of see where things are going and uh, the rest of the world is moving along and profession not as quickly. So, you know, we're, we're next for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I, I hadn't uh, heard that observation that, that we're sort of, the U.S. has been sort of behind in this. They're laggards. Um, I know a lot of the practice management philosophy came out of Australia in the 90s. There was a big push, a couple of organizations then. And then, yeah, interesting. So um, we usually think of U.S. as being first in those things. That's, um, I think you're right. It's, we're, we're behind. Well, the accounting profession is a risk adverse profession, right? So, you know, we kind of take it really slow. And Matt, I'd love to hear any kind of stories you, you see on your side, especially with like people advisory now in the wild, how firms are really rethinking it. But, you know, I, I remember sitting in front of Rod Drury, who was, who was the founder of Zero, and, and him almost like, you know, having the keys to the, to the, to the jail cell that I felt like the profession was in it was like, you're, you know, I remember him saying like, you're more than just a number cruncher, right? You're more than just a paper pusher and, and a tax filer, you know, you, you're an advisor. And I, I remember a lot of this early kind of like just mental work happening, you know, 10, 12, 13 years ago, thinking to myself, yeah, I am more than that. Um, whereas we've been under, you know, a profession of like decades and decades and decades of stigmas and we're nothing more than just some, someone who can submit tax returns or get books in, in order. Um, so, I mean, I really appreciate those days because that's, that's, that's why we're here today. And, and we're kind of saying the things that we're saying and doing the things that we're doing, but um, you know, Matt works really closely with a lot of those. What have you seen out in the field, Matt? Yeah. So honestly, you know, as you we were talking, I was, I was thinking about the best way to, to put this. And I think what happened here, uh, the realization as, as you asked Brandon, like, well, how did you discover this? We heard from Will how you discovered this. I think with regards to the partners that I'm working with, and to give you an idea, Augusto works with, uh, give or take, this number is growing every day, but around 6,500 or 7,000 accounting partners at the current time, right? I personally work with anywhere between two and 300 at any given time. So I've got a pretty good sample size of different uh, accounting professionals out there that I work with. And I think what happened in this pandemic is that it actually, uh, it actually preceded the inevitable. Uh, and what I mean by that is we have not only a new generation of, of, you know, of human beings coming up. We talk about Gen Z, we talk about millennial, we talk about baby boomers, right? So back to the cultural piece we talked about first, we've got those already starting to intermingle in the workplace and the culture aspect. But we also have a, a new generation of business owners and they're millennials. And these millennials uh, have one of the highest entrepreneurial spirits of all time. If we look at, at, at data there, you've got, you know, take Gusto, for example, you had three young guys graduated from Stanford uh, in their mid to early twenties who started this company. And that's becoming more and more popular uh, in the business sector. And what are these small business clients and what are these business clients looking for when they're looking for their accounting partner? looking for modern. They're looking for somebody who's modern, who's polished, who can, doesn't have to come into their office and meet with them, you know, physically, who can just hop on a Zoom call, who can text them if they need to. They're looking for someone who has that ability and has the tech stack that is accessible right from their phone, right? So I think that was the inevitable, and I don't think we're quite there yet. We're, we're starting to see it more and more. Give it a, a few more years before you start seeing uh, that take over and saturate the small business marketplace. But what the pandemic did is it kind of forced that hand a little bit. Uh, so I'm talking to partners from around the country of all sizes, you know, single, single uh, man shops uh, to 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 accountants, you know, staff accountants on hand. We've got all the different sizes. And what we're seeing out there is a lot of people who just weren't quite ready uh, they've had this uh, practice established for 35, 40 years, not quite ready to make the switch over into these cloud-based solutions. But then the pandemic happened and that did force the hand. 
They had no other choice. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm seeing. That discovery, unfortunately, came with with uh, you know COVID. Uh, but I do think that discovery was inevitable here in the next few years when you start looking at small business owners and clientele who are going to make their decision on their accounting firm and their accounting partner based on the technology they utilize. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the higher, the higher the tech firm, I think the, you're going to attract better and better clients. Yeah. You're going to attract the kind of clients that most CPAs want. Right. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, yeah. The pandemic has kind of, gosh, it's forced so many changes. It's, uh, yeah. I love blaming the pandemic for everything. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, but it's a good thing. I mean, I think it's a good, a good thing. Yeah. So um, what, what do you think are threats to the industry? What are serious threats to the profession? I, 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 I can definitely speak to this. I, I've, I've spent, so I've been at Gusto for 15 months and I've spent many a days and nights even before Gusto thinking about this specific question um, because I didn't want to fall prey to the threats that I felt like my practice could have fallen prey to. Um, I think the, the biggest threat to the profession is not a lack of resourcing, not a lack of, of collaboration, definitely not a lack of, of tools and enablement material and, and, and educational moments. Uh, the biggest threat to the profession is, um, is the profession's own behavior around creating, uh, you know, um, laying hold to the way the profession has interacted as a, as a, um, as sacred. That is the way we engage clients should maintain is sacred. Therefore it should not change. Um, and so I, for me, that's the greatest threat of this, of just accounting is if you, if you think the way we used to interact with clients and manage a firm and manage a team or firm members um, is absolutely sacred and should be kept in place um, very similarly to like it was 10 years ago, 15, 20, 30, um, that is going to be pretty much, you're going to be handed your hat at the door because the, the profession has moved drastically in the, in the past 10 years. The approach of how to run a practice and manage clients has moved drastically in the past 10 years. And if you treat what you've done as sacred and you're unable to pivot those specific areas to meet the moment, it's, you're, you're pretty much, you're going to be swept out with the sea. Um, and, and for me, that's really scary for my profession because I want my profession to advance. Right. And I, I, uh, so prior to coming to Gusto, I spoke quite a bit through Beta Alpha Psi, which Beta Alpha Psi is a accounting fraternity in universities and colleges and everything. And, uh, in my area, I was, I, I graduated from Florida Atlantic university. So in South Florida. Uh, so I used to speak at Florida Atlantic university, uh, Palm Beach Atlantic university, Lynn university and university of Miami through Beta Alpha Psi. And speaking about where the profession was going, what is different about the profession literally right outside the front doors of that, of that university. And uh, I remember vividly students coming up to me saying, I, I don't want to work. I, I love accounting, but I don't want to work for a practice like that practice or that practice because I, I want what you're talking about, but we just don't see it out there. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the only threat is us not moving forward and us thinking that, you know, we need to hold on to the ship as it's sinking. We need to like, you know, inflate the raft and just keep going um, and, and meet clients where they need to meet, be and, and meet your teams where they want to be as far as their professional development. Yeah. I, somebody told me, I guess, gosh, 10 years ago, I think it was Rick Payne, who is also from Australia. And he said that the accounting profession will change when the cost of not changing exceeds the cost of changing. There you go. And I feel like we're at that point. We're at that point. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, cool. That's, um, I, I, yeah, I agree. There's, there's, uh, a lot of change resistance accountants that still exist and, 
unfortunately on our side from a mergers and acquisitions perspective we're we're talking with owners who they're just not there's not a lot of demand for those firms other than people who are willing to transform them yeah mm. and that's um a smaller part of the market um right when you're when you're looking at that brand it's a interesting question that i uh, kind of thought about as you were talking you're looking at the brokerage of firms what are you hearing from the buyers potential buyers uh, what are they looking for as far as when it comes to the firm efficiencies and internal processes and, and technologies that they're using is that something that comes up in, in conversation when they're looking for you know a firm to acquire well I I think that the technology specifically doesn't come up as much as you would think. Right. What does come up is, look, I don't want to work as many hours as the previous owner has worked. Right. That is becoming probably the biggest objection that we're seeing with the generational shift. And, you know, people um, characterize millennials as, sometimes in a negative light. And I think, wait a minute, they're, they know what they want and they're going to figure out how to get it. And I'm seeing that, you know, the buyers are coming at these firms, looking at them from that kind of bird's eye view. Cause when you're, when you're first looking at a practice to acquire, you want to just take in the high level. Um, they're seeing these flaws you know, immediately, like the owner hours are too high, the profitability is too low. So they want, they want quality of life. They want decent cash flow for their investment. And um, the tools, I think they realize just intuitively that most of the practices they buy they they may have some retooling to do. Right. Right. But that could be, what would it be wrong? And again, I'm, I don't think I ever dream of of buying an accounting practice. So my my uh, my naivety here is a little bit uh, prevalent. But w- would you say like if you were able to if you had a firm that's that's going on the market and they have the tools in place and they're operating at peak per you oh, know, yeah. efficiencies and performance is that a big is that a big like big Red flag. Uh, but yeah, like a good flag to like uh, the the buyer who's like oh my gosh this this firm has this yep. firm has got it. They've, they're operating, they're hitting on all cylinders. Yeah. Let's talk. Yeah. We just, we just created a new category on our listing page for cloud firms. Um, yeah. Cloud firms. Yeah. We, we've sold, I think we've maybe sold more cloud firms than anybody. And the demand is uh, substantially higher for cloud firms when they go in the market. I have a theory about that, that I'd love to share. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on it, but I, I, my, my, my gut instinct is to say is that traditional or conventional firms are acquiring cloud firms because they're trying to do a reverse merger of the cloud yeah. into their practices. Yeah, they I agree. Have, they don't have the resources nor the talent to actually uh, do it well. And, and so therefore they go out and acquire these cloud firms to, to do kind of like a little bit of a reverse merger. And it's not a bad strategy because no, it's not. Yeah, because change is very, very difficult. So when you acquire something that's already working that way, then it's easy to uh, have the other parts of the firms even incrementally swept into that world, right? Yeah. Because every every client transformation, it's one client at a time right? Every conversion from QuickBooks to QuickBooks online or, or to zero is a, is a one-off conversion and you've got to convert that client. So, and you've got to convert the staff to the new way of doing it. So it's not a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it makes a ton of sense and it, and it, and it should be also a wake up call for those who aren't going to do a reverse merger of the cloud, but are not a cloud firm. Yeah. Um, you know, and so you got to really think to yourself long and hard about what that means for yourself. 
um, if, especially if you're seeing that a lot of cloud firms are being acquired and, and, and there's probably more of an interest for that than there is for the alternative. But, but, but to your point earlier about the separation of what you are and what your, what your solutions are, just being a cloud firm does not automatically make you a good firm. Right. Right. Like if you're not hiring the right people, if you're not making those basic uh, foundational type decisions, well, the technology is not going to save you. Like, yeah. like if your pricing decisions are off, if your service offerings are off, if your staffing is off, it's, you're still off. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, when, when Gusto launched uh, people advisory, I wrote um, our 60 page playbook called the people advisory playbook. And in chapter two of that playbook, I write about how, what the tr transformation moment happens when you adopt something like people advisory and, and that digital transformation includes people processes and tools. And to your point, it's, it's not like if you think if you're going to put all your eggs in just the software basket and you think that's what makes you become modern and successful, it's anything, but it's, mm -hmm. it's your people. It's creating a culture of, of collaboration uh, that can speak to the long-term vision of the firm and help you make decisions to that end. It's your processes. You got to really rethink your processes. How are you, how are you approaching internal work versus external work and deliverables? And then it's the tools, it's the software, right? Um, and it all has to come together nicely in a way that that really drives value. We, um, we partnered with Practice Ignition and uh, Practice Ignition did some, some great um, uh, data mining for us uh, around like the ROI of when a firm really hones in on those three areas and goes out to market to capture that value with clients through engagement letters. And if you had a modern firm or conventional firm where you redefined or retooled your people, processes, and tools, and you were able to lock in clients on engagement letters that had those tools and those softwares bundled in. So if, you, if they were locked in on a monthly recurring engagement, had apps bundled in, your revenue would literally increase by 3.41 times more than if you were not doing that. Yeah. And it, it's drastic. And, um, and it really is something that uh, that's palpable and that that you could see on the bottom line and at the top line and and see in the sentiment of the team as well. Yeah. yeah. I actually have a buyer that sort of did that and he tripled his revenue in the first year. We did a podcast with him. His name is Jason Ding. If anybody wants to listen to have you know have a listen to someone who transformed a firm. Um by doing basically what you're talking about. It's the packaging. Um, yeah. And bundling. And you know, clients love it. Clients would prefer, they prefer it. Yeah, they do. So, um, so with the threat of change and we've talked a lot about opportunities, but what do you think are the biggest opportunities right now that uh, accountants can uh, capitalize on? Yeah, you know, I, I'll speak to two audiences, I think. I, I, unfortunately, I think we'll, I'll have to break this answer to two audiences. I think if, you are, um, if you've not spent a lot of time thinking about or, or working on trying to advance your, pra your practice, then the, the obvious opportunity is to do that. <laughs> um, you know, 2020 um, is the year of change, right? Uh, it's not an optional item. It is the year of change. So if, you, if you've been on the fence and you've just been like, I don't know how to really retool this, there's, I can tell you right now, there's a lot more resources now than there was 10 years ago when I was trying to figure it out. So, you know, the communi community and the vendors and the software vendors and, and, the, and the community leaders uh, like yourself and, and, and myself here at Gusto um, are leading the way and can easily help you get your practice to the other side where I think if you are on the front lines, like I was at my practice, uh, where's the opportunity, where's the green field here is to continue doing what you're doing, but then actually identify certain services within your practice 
that have not been modernized with people, processes, and tools. Um, I'm thinking of things like sales tax, thinking of things like payroll. In fact, that's why People Advisory Powered by Gusto came out. P payroll was is a service that has always been approached very conventionally from an accountant's perspective. And while the profession has drastically moved towards advisory, it's only moved towards advisory in two main areas of practice life, technology and financial statement work, right? And so those are the only the two main areas of practice life and service offerings that, that firms have really modernized around. Um, plenty of technology to be a technologist around and consulting and implementing, implementing tech stacks and you know, that's very modern. Same thing with financial statements. Let's get your, your, your bookkeeping into the cloud, right? Let's, let's connect zero with Fathom HQ or Giraffe or whatever. And we can do some modeling and all this kind of stuff. But there are other services that need to be progressed. Um, and, and, and for me, at least, that's the reason why I came to Gusto was payroll, in my opinion, is obviously top three in the stats when you look at just all the top three services that firms offer. And that's the area that needed to be progressed. So my recommendation to anybody on the front lines is identify other areas of practice life beyond technology and beyond financial statement work that needs to be modernized and progressed. Yeah, I like that. I think to your point about payroll being modernized, one observation I've had with smaller firms is if they're only doing a little bit of payroll, it's probably a drain on the firm if they're doing it in-house, um, there's just so many complications. You've got to have people regularly there to do it. Um, it just takes the focus off of the other parts of the practice that are probably more, more profitable for that practice. It's the same way with audit work. If you're only doing a little bit of audit or a little bit of anything and you're not focused on it, it's probably not profitable for you. Yeah. And, yeah, and you, and you definitely need a reason to go up the continuum of value in any right. kind of service, right? And so payroll for conventionally for a long time, no one in the no software vendor in the payroll industry has actually created an opportunity for accounts to go upstream towards advisory while utilizing that same service offering as yeah. fundamental compliance work. And, uh, and that's why I just couldn't be more proud, at least, for, to, to, to try to cre uh, generate that new moment for the profession. In fact, Accounts World did a, a white paper on people advisory saying that this is the place to go when you want to generate more revenues for yourself, where it's a, it's a race to the top now when it comes to payroll, not a race to the bottom of the, of the cost or even the revenue sharing. So now... Um, is a great time to even really reconsider payroll. In fact, I still manage one client and I, I do offer people advisory to them. They pay me $1,500 a month and they're on Gusto. And they, I think my Gusto fee is like $75, right? And so that spread is a lot more beneficial for a firm because what am I selling? Well, I'm not selling payroll. I'm selling an advisory that really manage, that helps you become a better employer um, and helps you really support your team long term, and so if I could, that's if that's the advisory service that I can offer you, then I'm not yeah, as a professional. I'm not trying to chase down to the bottom of like what's the cheapest payroll I can get. Now now it's more like how much can I charge my client in order to get away with this, um, where it's real value being delivered yeah. and they see value in that. Yeah, and and as when I switch to Gusto. I could see how, wow, this is the automation here is just incredible. Like it's, it's, um, yeah. Um, well, how, um, how can Gusto, um, how can people find out more about Gusto and how it operates and how it works? I can take this one. Uh, well, absolutely. Of course you can go to gusto.com forward slash partners. Uh, you can check it all out. Uh, and then, you know, I would love to have a conversation with anyone listening to the podcast here. Um, just shoot me over a, a quick email at matt.woodson at gusto.com. And we can kind of introduce you to, to Gusto. And so, you know, when thinking about the Gusto platform, uh, keep in mind, this is not a DIY white label back office solution. Uh, this is a cloud-based piece of tech that is actually very beautiful when you when you think about uh, how the design is. 
um, from, you know, from, from logging in to receiving a happy payday email for your clients, employees, to the buttons and the colors and the feel of the platform. Um, this is something that is really going to help transform uh, what Will was just talking about in the sense of the people advisory services. But for sure, check out, uh, you know, gusto.com forward slash partners. If you want more information on the playbook Will was referencing, uh, you can contact me and we can get you signed up to be a partner to access that playbook as well as people advisory certification training. There's all the kind of stuff that we can start pumping resources into you. Um, yeah. And, and I understand there are incentives that um, or, or discounts you can offer to clients. Um, so is, is there a link or something I could share on the blog post for any of that information or? Yeah. So there's a link again, all that information will be just on gusto.com. Okay. Uh, but to give, you know, listeners uh, and anybody out there who is considering um, trying this out to give you an idea of what the partner program, as we refer to it here at Gusto is about, uh, it, it's a no cost or obligation to you as a, as an accounting partner, uh, first and foremost, uh, what you'll get is a centralized dashboard where you can access all your clients' reports, their profiles, uh, everything you need from one login. You also have the opportunity to pass on discounts to your clients uh, or take on a monthly recurring revenue share uh, for these clients. So let's say, you know, we've, I've got some firms out there with 100, 150 clients on Gusto and their revenue share on a monthly basis is up in the couple thousand dollar range. And while that's not creating an entire new revenue stream for you, it is allowing, you know, all different kind of things that you can do with that money, whether it's reinvesting it back into your firm, whether it's taking care of your team and sending them, you know, gifts or doing lunches, there's a lot of things you can do with that. And on the flip side, if you just want to take care of your clients and make sure that they're getting the best value, say they're paying for the service, you can pass on that discount to them as well. But uh, the other piece of that, Brandon, is, is anybody listening, anybody who sends me an email that says they um, heard about Gusto for partners from you or from your podcast, uh, we'll actually give you 500 bucks Amazon gift card when you sign up your first three clients in 12 months. So you think about that three clients, they can be any size. There's no, you know, fine print there. Uh, it's a $500 Amazon gift card coming your way. Uh, so that's something else that we can definitely look at. Cool. All right. Well, guys, I, I can't think of anything else. This has been a very enlightening, uh, hour, a little over an hour here almost. Um, thank you for your time and all your insight. Um, I know our listeners are going to enjoy listening to this. So thanks again. Well, hey, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Accountant's Flight Plan Podcast. If you like what you heard today, please follow us so that you can get updates when new episodes are released and share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. You can also follow Poe Group Advisors on social media. Please visit our website for more information at pogroupadvisors.com.